This weekend is ImagineCon at the Gallatin Public Library. Unfortunately, this video is gonna get released way after that's passed, but I am doing a zine workshop and I thought I would share with you guys some of the tips and tricks for making mini comics and zines. I have two other videos, at least two, I think it's, I think it's two, it might be three. I have other videos in the zine making series, including one where I make a micro mini, one sheet of paper, eight pages of comics, another where I flip through just a small sample of my huge mini comic and zine collection and talk about content and bindings, and then a third where we talk about assembly. This is going to be another assembly video. I hope it is helpful, useful, and inspiring, and I will keep nagging my partner Partner to do that InDesign walkthrough to actually show you guys how to lay out these pages. So let's go ahead and get started. The materials you're going to need to make your own mini comics and zines are your cover stock, and it can be colored paper or you can do a color printed cover, your inner stock, and I generally use cheap printer paper, just something thick enough that when I print black and white, it won't show all the way through because these are meant to be inexpensive a long arm stapler. I have here a long reach one finger 25 sheet paper pro stapler. You don't have to get this one, but I've had this one for 10 years. It has seen thousands of mini comics and it's still holding up strong. So I can't help but recommend it. You ideally want a long reach stapler that has a ruler on both sides. It's very handy as well as a lineup guide. This is gonna be helpful in a minute. You're gonna want a bone folder or the back end of a butter knife. A bone folder is just simply a piece of plastic, maybe melamine plastic that's designed to help get a perfect crease. It's one of those items that you buy once and you'll use it every time you make minis. So it's sort of an investment piece and it really doesn't cost much. It's like $5. Um, you're also going to want your stuff printed. You can print it at a place like Office Max or Staples, but I have found that due to downsizing, their print staff don't know how to work any of the machines. So I just went and bought a toner printer and I use a very small Dell NCW 1760. I believe you can check the description below for the exact model. It's, I get it when it's on slick deals for sub 80, but it's usually $114 and you'll definitely get a lot of black and white minis out of it. Now, the only problem with that little Dell printer is if you're printing on cardstock, it'll print one side just fine, but, and I'll show you guys, the heat will make your covers curl up. These have actually been sitting, so they'll straighten out, but they'll curl up so bad you can't run them through and print the other side. So if you have a double-sided cover, like a lot of my covers are, with a heavier cardstock, that's just not going to work. And I print, as you guys can see here, I print my interiors and my covers separately, just because that little NCW toner printer is kind of prone to jamming. So these mini comics were laid out in InDesign and then saved as booklet PDFs. And like I said, I'll start nagging my partner to do a tutorial on that because I think that's really helpful information for making zines and mini comics. It makes it a lot easier than trying to lay it out in Photoshop and account for all your pages. And we have double-sided printing. I had to hand duplex these, which means I, um, they print all one side and then I go over and <laughs> I flip it. But there are duplexing machines available that would make it even easier for you to duplex your own comics or to print your own comics. And my cover sheets are saved as a separate PDF booklet. And these should have a calendar inside, but due to printing problems that I just described, I couldn't print the calendar. It's not really that big a deal. It's just a nice extra. It doesn't really detract from the enjoyment of the comic itself. And tip, well, actually this is more of a sketchbook or an ash can. Typically I will make these sort of minis out of my Inktober illustrations, out of, I have some mermaid illustrations in progress. I'll have just enough to make a small mini and I'm gonna do these in color. 
Um, I will do them with certain prompts. There are a few comics in my mini comic collection, but since I'm so busy working on 7-inch Kara and trying to find long form lasting work in the art field, I don't really have time to just make minis unless they're for anthologies. So when I assemble, move this whole stack of minis, when I assemble these, what I will typically do is it's see it's stubborn it's got a mind of its own i'll go ahead and pre-fold the cover and this is so that i can get a nice clean even fold and when i don't even um press this all the way down i just make sure that the edges are lined up and then i use my bone folder to get a nice clean crease then i do the interior for that book Make sure the pages are all lined up and do the same thing. Hold it down, crease it a couple times for really thick books. Um, like I had a color sketchbook for a while. I will uh, do half of the pages and then the other half of the pages. In fact, that book is so thick it has to be stapled with a staple gun. So I quit offering it because it's just kind of too much of a hassle and people didn't want to pay the six dollars for it so wasn't worth my time okay so you want to line this up at five and a half if you're doing an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper fold it in half to make your mini if you're doing another size ratio you're going to have to of course adjust for that and i used to do minis in other sizes like when i would do anthologies with my friend heidi black uh oh both of our monster books that we did were um sorry i'm having a hard time talking and stapling apparently so all right we have misstapled you can use your bone folder or you can use a staple remover oh this is gonna be a yeah it's going to be a stubborn one. So I do not have a staple remover. Or I do, and I have no idea where it is, is the better answer. So when we miss staple like that, we have to remove it, of course. Anyway, um, Heidi and I would make square shaped minis. And uh, those were a lot of trouble because we had to use a paper cutter to trim every single one and that is fine for like 10 but it is a huge pain in the butt when you're making like 50 and you're making 50 so that you can distribute them to the other people in the in the anthology that sort of thing so i opt not to do fun formats just because for what people are willing to pay for minis here in the south it's just not really worth the effort. Plus I find spending too, too much time finessing these takes away from my time for making comics or making these videos for you guys or making, writing blog posts. I just, maybe someday I'll get back to doing really cool minis, especially if I have people to work with. Doing it by myself when I'm just collating my Inktober stuff into a cute book. Yeah, not as necessary. And I do have a video on how to make your minis a little more special. And it's very simple. You can use gel pens, you can use markers, you can use stickers, just anything to make them feel even more handmade. So another thing I will do is, rather than assemble, staple, assemble, staple, I will assemble all of them in batch and then I will staple all of them in batch. I also typically prefer to work at my much larger than my desk kitchen table, but that's a little harder to record at. So and then so that they kind of not dry, but fold a little flatter, I will alternate them and stack them. This way they take up less space because when you have them all aligned at the spine, 
it gets thick really quick. So alternating them is a good way to conserve space and to protect your minis in transit. So typically with my zines, there's a fair amount of layout and design involved from an attractive cover that people are gonna wanna pick up with hand lettering and drawn accents to an attractive page layout that's easy to understand. For Inktobers, I really like including the day as well as the subject matter. And then as my zines and minis get a little more personal, I also like including like a little quip at the bottom, like for this music theme mermaid, in order to hear her siren song under the surf, she needs clamshell headphones. I mean, it's not the wittiest thing in the world, but people seem to dig it. And I remember when I would write the copy for the monster books, the friendly book of monsters and the little book of monsters, um, People really like the copy that I would write for their monsters and readers really seemed to like and like thought it was really witty. So for me, these sketchbooks aren't just about my illustrations because I have a very simple, open, cartoony style. It doesn't take 10 minutes to parse the illustration. So I kind of need to include, or I feel like I need to include more of myself in here. And I do that by writing a catfish mermaid in a swamp would need to be swift to avoid all them gators a lifetime of swimming keeps you young you know just like a little bit extra to make it a little bit more enjoyable so that you can share it with somebody instead of just like quickly flipping through the pictures and then like okay i'm done so here's an example of one of my rare, actually a mini comic, mini comics. This is Pickin' and Peelin'. It's one of my stories from my Cicada Summer pitch. And this is about growing up in Louisiana in the early 2000s. So this particular one is about a crawfish boil. And what's neat about this is I have actually shared every step of this process here on the channel. You can check out my intro to Comic Craft, Cicada Summer subsection to see how I made this comic from planning it out to character designs to working on the actual pages. So if you actually want to know how to, how to go about making the nuts and bolts of a comic, you should definitely check that out because it's done in a very succinct form since it's a mini comic. And that's usually what I recommend people do. People don't like hearing that. They want to start with their grand epic, but I really recommend you start with a mini comic. Start with something 10 pages, eight pages, self-contained. It can be in your epic's world. It can tell one part of your epic story, but just it gives you a chance to practice, to get to know the characters, to get some experience under your belt. I promise it's going to make your long form comics so much better. And I wish I had more time to make mini comics because there's just something really satisfying about being able to tell a story in a limited number of pages. And I've been printed in several anthologies from Hannah Doka Q Hannah, Doki, Kira, to Chainmail Bikini, to um, Ladies Night Six, Eat It Up, to uh, Thousand and One Nights. So I've done a lot of self-contained mini comics and I have a lot of ideas left to explore. I just seem to be missing all of the calls for entry this year, but maybe I should just try to make it a point to do one mini comic a year. And that gives you something a little bit different from your norm. So if you're actually trying to find a publisher, it gives you a different style to work in, a different type of story to work in. This is auto bio, it's fairly realistic. The characters are still drawn really cartoony though, but it's completely, a completely different style from like my normal drawing style, which is watercolor. This is very heavy spot black. So doing a mini comic is a great way to get your feet wet making comics. This cover for Pickin' and Peeling was printed on craft paper. So it's actually very thin paper. And as you can see, I was actually able to get it through my printer a second time so that I could do the month calendar view. So you guys can see I have every day's theme on the calendar view and it's not going to be seen as a whole since it's the interior cover it's just kind of a nice extra you could also sketch something on the interior cover and then so here's 
an example spread. I got really into Inktober this year because I used it as Lilliputian world building prompts and I've shared some of those illustrations here on my channel as well if you want to see me ink them. But the thing was I would do an illustration based on a Lilliputian prompt. Um, as part of the world building I focused on doing careers and skills and trades. So to, this is a mini that demonstrates it's actually really more like a little prose book with illustrations. So it's like a picture book. Um, but it, it covers 31 different Lilliputian professions and kind of explores how their communities work. And there's a black and white illustration on the left side of the page. And then there's the world building text. So this is Scribe. While many Lilliputians are literate or can read simple sentences, scribes are invaluable for recording important community events births, weddings, deaths, major transactions. Using quills made from downy feathers and ink made from walnut hulls or gathered paper, on gathered paper bark, scribes also act as notaries and may transcribe important letters. Scribes are unwelcome in traditional Lilliputian communities as most only write in human languages using human letter forms. And this is what I mean by one of those thicker ones. It's just slightly too thick to get a nice clean fold. And something else I want you guys to notice is that when we print it in booklet form, your pages are not going to align. They're going to be spread out over that undone spreads. The only one that's going to truly align is your middle page. So you can use that, well, your middle and your back. So you should use those as your two guideposts to make sure you're kind of on the right track. And this was originally laid out in Photoshop and then it was laid out as a booklet using InDesign because math is not my strongest suit. And this is a type of math that my brain just does not want to do. And that's why InDesign makes it so much easier. And I was really, really proud of this one and really disappointed in the reception. I put a lot of care and a lot of love into this. It was a topic I thought, um, because people have expressed a lot of interest in the world building for 7-inch Kara, I really thought they would be into it. And I shared it on my Instagram and it got kind of a mad reaction. But it's something I'm still really proud of. I think it's really cute. Um, I think it would be a great little mini for a parent to share with their kid. I don't think there's like enough zines and minis out there that are all ages. So I guess I'm making them. That's another thing to keep in mind. If you're not a super popular artist, if you don't have a huge following, your zine, unless it's like a fandom zine, you might sell two or three per show. Uh, mini comics are not a huge seller. It's really kind of a labor of love sort of thing. And I, really love the nature of like tiny micro press, um, self distribution, that sort of thing. I really love that comic artists have the ability to manufacture their own goods in home and then directly sell it to the customer who they see physically at a convention. Um, there's something just really appealing to me about that. So that's one of the reasons I keep doing this, even though they're I mean, I'm not going to say zines fall out of favor because zines are huge, but those are mostly fandom zines or like corny zines. So um, just kind of original character or original concept zines don't typically do well unless you're a particularly popular artist or you're in an anthology with some particularly popular artists. So I'm warning you guys about this just so that if you decide you want to do it, um, you just kind of know what your numbers are going to look like. You don't uh, make a hundred of one of um, one mini for your first con and then are disappointed that you didn't sell out of them. You might. I mean, far be it for me to tell you it's not going to happen. But, you know, don't be disappointed if it doesn't because that's not a reflection on you or the work you're making. It's just a kind of a reflection on the nature of the customer base and what their interests are. Phantom stuff is almost always an easier sell than original stuff. And I say this as somebody whose table has a lot of original stuff and I try to make sure there's always a lot of original stuff and it also has some fandom stuff. And fandom stuff is just always an easier sell because people already have an emotional connection with fandom stuff. 
And if you're someone who doesn't like that, then don't buy fandom stuff. Buy original stuff. I don't like it. So when I buy from other creators at shows, I buy their comics. I'll buy prints of their original characters. I'll basically do whatever I can to support them making original content. And it's not because I'm not involved in any fandoms or I don't have any fandoms. It's just that I want to see American creators make things for their audience. And I don't want the wall of fan art to be the only option for artists in the artist alley. And I think the only way you can prevent that is by supporting the people who are doing their own thing. And that's why I have like thousands of mini comics and zines because I will, if I'm at an anime con, I will literally buy every comic in the alley. If I'm at an indie con, I will buy a lot of comics, but not literally every comic in the alley. I can't afford to do that. So typically I try to make sure I have 10 of any mini in stock before I go to a show. Um, and that's getting a little harder because as my library grows, it's actually becoming more time consuming. So if you're smart, you'll restock. I say after the show, but like, let's be honest, nobody has the energy to want to restock right after the show. Most people are tired, but you'll restock not the night before the show. You'll make time to restock so that you're not stressing it. Especially if you have to go to some place like Staples or Office Depot, where um, back in my days when I used to get my minis printed through them, it would literally take them four hours because they would have to wait for the one person who knew how to work the machine to come in on their shift. So maybe that's changed, maybe they've upped their game, but they're not really gonna get my business. Especially the one here in, on West End is just like the worst, the worst, so. It was just easier for me to print it at home. And that was back in the days when I had two mini comics that I was printing. Okay, getting a little off your mark there. Two mini comics that I was printing and uh, it really got even more off your mark there. It really should have taken 30 minutes and it would take like four hours. We would get there at five and leave at closing with maybe our books. And sometimes with no, we'll call you tomorrow when we figure it out. So. Which is a shame because I had a really good friend who used to work at Office Depot and she was phenomenal at her job. Like she really did know how to work all the machines. She's the person who trained everyone else on how to do it and wasn't even paid to do that. She'd stay after and show them. And I don't think employees should be expected to do that. I think those companies should pay those employees to do that so they can actually provide customer service to their customers for the product they're purchasing. Enough about that. Let's talk a little bit about pricing once I reset my ruler. So the thing about zines, I will see little hand stapled minis like this go for a crazy range of prices. I've seen like eight page color zines go for like sell for $10 and up. And if you can get that, if you live in an area like San Francisco or New York where people are willing to pay that, that is phenomenal and good for you. However, I live in Nashville, Tennessee. That is not a reality. So for Lilliputian Living, because it's really a thick book and I put a lot of care into it. I think I charge six, but I might charge less. And then when I used to charge for picking and peeling, I would charge a dollar, but now I just give it away free to kids. Cause it's only eight pages. What the heck? It's only eight pages. Now I don't give it away free to adults. Adults have their own spending money. And I actually really dislike the idea of like having stuff on your table that is free for kids like beyond like stickers and stuff because it creates this notion with both the kids and the parents that their kids are entitled to free stuff and that every table should have free stuff for their children because they're a parent and being a parent with a kid at a con is hard because their kid wants everything at the show and they have to tell them no how dare you not every parent's like that but there was a spat in 
gosh, 2013, where like every other parent who came to my table pretty much demanded something free for their kid. And that's because we have free things for their kids. And why do we do that? Do we do it because we think it's gonna increase sales? Um, when I do it, it's because I just wanna instill a love of comics in kids. And I know at cons, their parents won't usually buy them. I've seen this happen where parents won't buy their kid anything at the show. The parent is laden down with their fandom stuff from the artist alley and from the dealer's room. And the kid doesn't get anything at all. And I don't understand parents like that, but okay. So I do have um, Kara stickers for kids for free and I have picking and peeling, but to be honest, I don't really expect anybody, anyone who gets this for free to check out the links on the back. That would be nice. That would be great, especially since I do kid lit comics, kid friendly comics and I'm trying to build up an audience, that would be a huge help. But they probably don't check those links. However, that's not a good reason not to put your branding on there. It's pretty simple to make an ad like this. It doesn't cost any extra money to print it because you have your cover, you just pop it on your back page. So even if you get like 10, Oh, pulling the staple is going to ruin this book. Even if you only get like 10 new anythings, clicks, let's just call it clicks because like there's no guarantee they're going to stick around, let alone buy something in the future. But even if you get just like 10 clicks for every 100 books you print, I mean, that's 10 clicks you weren't going to get. And it's minimal time. And an ad like this can be reused across all your minis. Now, a lot of people are moving towards perfect bound mini books. I don't want to call them minis or ash cans or zines because they're not. Uh, all of those words do kind of imply a handmade element. They're just perfect bound books and they're great and they're legit and I'm not dissing those. We're not going to talk about those today. That's a different price point. That is a different amount of work. That is not something that is typically done in-house. And I've only uh, done one perfect bound book, seven inch Kara volume one so far. And I did it with Create Space. And I believe I have a review of my thoughts of Create Space. Their quality shifts over the years and their customer service is not good. Um, so I don't like recommending them, but other people seem to love them. And if you're working in black and white, they're a very economical print on demand option with a fairly fast turnaround. And if you know how to lay out your own book, then there's not really a good reason not to go with them because the chances of them royally screwing up your black and white book are pretty low. When they've screwed up with Kara, um, it was color problems. And the work I did with Gizmo Grandma, it was they just did a really garbage job laying out the book and I sent them 600 DPI files of the illustrations and they would upload pixel or the book has pixelated images in it and like just their layout service is terrible and doesn't care and doesn't double check. And when you ask them to go back and fix it, they don't want to. So I would not ever recommend Create Space for laying out your book. Just pay somebody to lay out your book if you don't know how to do it. There's plenty of comic artists on Twitter who have that skill set who will charge way less than the $2,000 Create Space will charge for it. I have another long arm stapler. This one's jammed. So this long arm stapler is not nearly as nice as the jammed one. This is a, really? I have to be getting that wrong, whatever. Nope, it's a Rapesco. Rapesco probably, but that's a name. And I haven't used this thing in several years. So you guys are gonna have to forgive me.
I will fix. Are you seriously out of staples? <laughs> Ugh. I think it's these green staples that jammed the other one because they have a coating on them to make them green. And they can be kind of funny, but they're what I have. And both of my long arm staplers take the normal size staples. They're not anything super fancy. What I don't like about this one is the ruler is just kind of useless. But I have a busy work day today with a lot of con prep and then a lot of work work. So I can't be messing around with a broken stapler for a half hour. Oh, did you jam again? Oh, this video is going to be just like watch Becca fight with two different long arm staplers for 30 minutes. So I guess for the sanity of everyone. This is a vlog, I guess, about making and assembling mini comics. A very little bit about selling mini comics and kind of what your sales are gonna look like. Not really much about pricing and then a rant about CreateSpace. So I hope you guys found this video to be helpful, useful and informative. I really hope it inspires you to make your own minis. They're very easy to do. They're pretty fun to make. It's a great way to give life to some of your favorite sketches or to give life to your Inktober drawings. Um, it's a good way to create original merch for your table. A lot of cons look really favorably upon um, people with original books to sell because a lot of cons are trying to find things other than fan art walls to have in their alleys. So even if you have a fan art wall, having a few minis on your table is always a good idea, I think, but I'm biased. Um, and there's always gonna be people who are looking for original stuff. So you might not make as many sales as you will selling fan art prints, but, or fan art merchandise, fan art keychains, etc. but to me, there's something a lot more fulfilling to do, to make something like this and to sell something like this that utilizes my original art. Ah! It's the last book and it's, it got caught right there. Why would you design something like that? Becca fights a poorly designed stapler. Anyway, I am a big fan of minis and I usually go out of my way to buy or trade for minis depending on the will of the artist. Not everybody likes to trade. I like to trade. I'm down for trading. Um, but not everybody wants to do that. And I respect that. Um, it's not quite in keeping with the original nature of zine culture, mini comic culture, but you know what? Things change, people change, times change. So, you know, if it doesn't work for you, if you don't want to do it, it doesn't work for you and that's fine. I'm trying to find something small enough to get this one stinking stapler out of, why would you do this? Uh, got it. Now I get to clean up a bunch of dead stapler, staples from my dust. But, um, geez, words, whatever. Yeah, so if you see me at a con and you got a mini comic or a zine or a collection of sketches and you want to trade me for any of my minis, please come say hi. You'll see me under the Natto Soup banner. Um, I, like I said, I hope this was helpful, useful, and informative for you guys. I'm really sorry about all the complaining, but I ended up making a nice fat stack of minis today, so that's always awesome. I will see you guys again really soon with another video, and I hope you guys will check out my Intro to Comic Craft playlist. Bye, guys!